Hey guys, Eric here, and I'm with a very special guest, executive producer, showrunner of Daredevil, Stephen Denight. Stephen, thanks for being here. It's a pleasure to be here. So, we're going to dive deep into Daredevil Season 1, which I'm guessing most people watching this now have seen, but this is your fair warning. I, I hope you've seen it twice by now. Yeah, yeah. I'm actually almost through my rewatch. You see? Yeah. <laughs> so I've got three left. <laughs> That's it. That's what we like <laughs> That's to hear. That's right. But we're going to spoil everything. We're going to talk about everything that happened. So, you've been warned. If you're still with us, we assume you, you're, you've watched it all. Maybe twice. Uh, so, you know, first of all... What's it like for you this past week? Because just as a content creator, I must imagine it's different for you. We talk about watching shows differently now with Netflix, but you're used to your show going up once a week, right. seeing the response every Friday when Spartacus was on. So what's it like for you now to have it all up and just the flood of response to 13 episodes of TV you created? It was fantastic. I think I'm ruined for life, <laughs> Yeah, quite frankly. Uh, because when you're doing week to week, you can have an episode that, people don't quite respond to. Right. And then they, you just get dogpiled. Ah, this show sucks. This is terrible. Yes. The great thing about 13 is then there's the next episode. And it's like, oh, now I see what they were doing in that other episode. Right. And it all ties together. And plus, just to have that response of somebody seeing it all. Mm -hmm. I mean, I keep thinking that if, if we had aired all 13 of Spartacus at the same time, I might not have gotten beat up quite as bad right, at, right. at the beginning <laughs> because it got continually better. And to be able to get there faster, I think is just phenomenal mm -hmm. for someone on my side of things. I mean, yeah, I, just, I was gonna say it must be, it, the, uh, obviously the response is highly positive. So was it, you know, was it crazy to go from all that work and you're just Thursday night, it's gonna go up at midnight, and then within 24 hours, less for some yeah, people, it, you're just seeing, okay, they like it. It was it was very strange. And I remember having an early conversation with Jeff Loeb, mm -hmm. the head of Marvel Television before it was released, saying it's so weird that we've worked nonstop so hard for a year, yeah. and people are gonna watch it over the weekend. And, and he said, yeah, you gotta think of it as like a 13 hour movie. Yeah, It's the same thing as working on a big movie for two, three years, and over the weekend, it's done. Yeah, and, but well received. Yeah. Uh, so let's talk about you know, some of the specifics, but first, in a sort of broader terms, I did wanna ask about uh, the, you know, the action scenes, which a lot of people are bringing up. Uh, you know, and, and you guys, both you and your cast have talked a lot in the past week about that amazing fight scene at mm -hmm. the end of episode two. So we don't need to go to those specifics. But one thing I really liked about the fight scenes is that Daredevil is constantly sort of winded. Yeah. He's got in that fight scene, it's, it's great that it's one shot, but it's also that he has to lean against the wall, mm -hmm. that he trips at one point. Was that something early on you knew that you didn't want him to be just the action guy who just seems completely unfazed by what's happening. Yeah, gr gritty and grounded is always the way we approached all aspects of the show, mm -hmm. especially the action part. We had a lot of conversations about the action. Because obviously I'm very invested in action coming yeah. from Spartacus and, and Angel and Buffy and, and those kind of shows. Um, so we really wanted to approach it. And, and I kept bringing up The Raid, The Raid 2, mm -hmm. uh, The Bourne movies, that we wanted that kind of feel. And uh, Philip Severa, our stunt coordinator, and, and his team, and especially Chris Brewster, who was Charlie's stunt double. Yeah. Uh, Chris Brewster also, you know, he's done a lot of Marvel work. He was in uh, uh, The Winter Soldier mm -hmm. as Chris Evans' stunt double. He really brought that kind of exhaustion and, and that kind of feel. And Charlie really, really latched onto that too. Because it's something we had, don't really see that much in, in superhero uh, shows. Yeah. Um, but since Matt Murdock is very human, and we always wanted to stress that he has heightened senses, but otherwise he's just a guy that pushed himself to the limit. Mm -hmm. And we really wanted to focus on that idea that Murdock's always get up. That, right, that right. Really, his most special gift is he will not stop. Mm -hmm. And they did such a fantastic job of realizing that on screen. Uh, you know, people have also brought up that, you know, it's pretty safe to say this is, might be the vi most violent MCU-related project yet mm -hmm. as far as visceral, you know, in terms of blood. What were your conversations like with Marvel? Because, you know, some people were surprised just going off the other stuff they put out. They thought, oh, I don't know if Marvel will kind of dealt, go there. Were they pretty open to the fact that this would be something different? It's going to be yeah. Netflix and Daredevil that works for that character? They very much wanted this to be, we called it PG-16 to yeah. start with, and then we realized that there was no PG-16, it's actually PG-15, <laughs> right. um, which translated to TVMA mm -hmm. on television. And that's what they always wanted. Um, you know, within that structure, there were a lot of conversations, obviously coming from Spartacus, yeah. I was 
pushing it towards, yeah. you know, uh, what I felt was right for the world. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to go full Spartacus on this, because <laughs> right. that would be way too far for Daredevil. Yeah. But I did want it to feel like that kind of Frank Miller, you know, that earlier days were when it was really gritty. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I always reference that, that scene where, uh, I believe it was in Born Again, where Matt Murdock, disoriented and, you know, has had everything stripped away from him, uh, comes across Turk dressed in a Santa Claus suit and, and gets stabbed in the stomach. <laughs> right. uh, it's that kind of thing that we want it to go, but not, not full R-rated with the violence. Mm -hmm. uh, to me, a full R-rated um, show in regards to the violence is The Walking Dead, a show that I love. Yeah. Um, but, you know, when they slam a, a car door on somebody's head, you see the head and you see the head get crushed. Mm -hmm. With us, we want it, you know, to shoot it under the car and see like the results, not the actual impact. Right. So that's a, that's a bit of the difference. Um, but Marvel was very supportive in wanting this to be a, a darker corner of the MCU. Mm -hmm. And uh, I really applaud them because it was a risk. You know, we had no idea how people would respond. And I had many conversations um, with Jeff Loeb and, and Drew Goddard and the rest of the team. Um, saying that, you know, there's a chance that there'll be a huge backlash, that all, all we'll get is, you know, I really love taking my kids to these movies, right, and now right. I, they can't see this. There's something different. Yeah. And, you know, I get a comment like that every now and then, but overall, the response has been, it's great to see that other side of Marvel mm -hmm. and to expand the universe of Marvel. Uh, you know, one big question in the plot, uh, sort of a, a an arc for Matt, really, is how far is he going to go, mm -hmm. and is he willing to kill... Uh, kill specifically Wilson, but others he encounters. How much did you play with that? You know, because you could see the version of this show where maybe halfway through he does kill someone and then maybe seeks penance and regrets it. So did you have a lot of conversations about how far, you know, where that story would go and how it would play out? Yeah, we never wanted him to intentionally kill anyone. Mm -hmm. uh, could certainly put a guy in coma. Right, right. <laughs> you know, and, and with, with Nobu, um, you know, Nobu, it was more of a deflection. Yeah. So he wasn't actively trying to kill Nobu. Right. And Nobu kind of brought it on himself. He did. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So we never intended him to, to go as far as to kill someone and, and, and regret it. Mm -hmm. It was always the moral question of how far do I go to save the city? And he certainly tried to kill Wilson Fisk mm -hmm. and then realized, you know, his mistake and, and how his, his desire to kill Wilson Fisk really almost led to his own death. Mm -hmm. Speaking of Wilson Fisk, I mean, he's he's a huge part of the show. Once we really, you know, you slowly build him up. But once we meet him, we really dive deep with him. And it's something you did on Spartacus as well. But is that just naturally kind of your inclination with the bad guy is let's really get to know them, see their motivations, and, you know, to some extent be sympathetic to them even though they need to be stopped? Is that just where you kind of lean with your, your villain? Absolutely. Very strongly. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I love a, an antagonist that at some point in the story, the audience says, oh, this guy's doing things that aren't right, but I kind of like him and I kind of understand why he's doing it. Mm -hmm. uh, and and I, I approached uh, uh, Fist the same way as I approached Badiatis or Crassus. Um, and, and there are echoes of that. Uh, I, I know at one point in Spartacus, Crassus has a line that basically says, you know, Whoever, who's the hero, who's the villain, you know, history will decide. Right. Because he thinks he's the hero and Spartacus thinks he's the hero. And that's, that's the same thing I applied here, mm -hmm. is that Matt thinks he's the hero, Wilson Fisk thinks he's the hero up until the very end. Yeah. And, and I think that's important. And Ben has that line that there are no heroes or villains, just people with different agendas. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's always very important to round out that antagonist and, and really have the audience have some sympathy for where they're coming from, even, mm -hmm. even if, because Matt and Wilson Fisk, their end goal is basically the same, yeah. is to make this city a better place. Mm -hmm. They're just, they have two completely different ideas of how to do it. Uh, you know, and we certainly see how much he cares for Vanessa. That's a huge part of the season as well. And she's fascinating, you know, the fact that she is not, you know, she doesn't recoil as she kind of learns what he is and what he does. Um, you know, have you thought about in, you know, potential future seasons, maybe we'll learn uh, a little, you know, she talks a little bit about her backstory, mm -hmm. might learn a little bit more about her history and kind of what formed her into, I don't want to say an, a moral person, but someone mm -hmm. who could put aside that part of Wilson. Yeah, I, there's definitely been discussions mm -hmm. about, you know, if, if the show continues, 
to explore that character a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, everything's very much up in the air and there's a lot of ideas floating around. But yeah, I, I also found that fascinating that, you know, he finds this woman and she has a very strong inkling of, of what he does. Mm -hmm. But, you know, she's cautious but doesn't shy away. It's, it's, it's very much a, a Tony Soprano kind of thing. Right, right. Uh, you, you know, that fascination, that, that fear and attraction, mm -hmm. both mixing together. Uh, you know, really, Wilson and Vanessa is the love story of the season. And, you know, Matt and Claire, there's looks like something could happen, mm -hmm. but it doesn't. And then there's some interesting stuff with uh, Foggy and Karen, just as someone who reads the comics. I was like, oh, is this going down that road? And might there be a love triangle? Mm -hmm. You don't, you know, you could go there in the future, but you don't really actively, like, Karen doesn't become, like, right. the girlfriend to anyone. Was that something where you really, with the, the Nelson and Murdoch side of it, you just were like, there, there doesn't need to be this season a love story per se? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, you know, Spartacus, I keep going back to Spartacus, yeah. uh, I always said it was a soap opera with the emphasis on the opera part. Right, right. A um, lot of relationships, a lot of, you know, shifting back and forth. Um, really wanted to avoid that in this season. I, I didn't want to fall into the, the soap opera trappings of telling mm -hmm. a superhero story. I mean, there are definitely romantic attractions, um, especially between Matt and Claire. But even that, I, you know, we wanted to look at it in a more realistic way of, you know, how far would Claire actually allow herself to get involved right. with a guy who's involved in these activities. And also, uh, Matt is absolutely in no space to have a, a healthy relationship no. at this point. So we wanted to, you know, allude to possibilities. And um, like with Foggy and Karen, you know, there's that, that great run in uh, Daredevil Yellow. Mm -hmm. Where where Foggy uh, you know is is very very uh, attracted to Karen and, and and if memory serves me I I think is thinking about asking her to marry him mm -hmm. and uh, then finds out that Matt and Karen right. are getting together so we definitely wanted to tip our hat to that but mm -hmm. not not get into the is she going to be with Matt is she going to be with Foggy um, it just didn't feel right for this season and what was going on Karen there's a lot of intriguing hints about her past little references Ben makes and then obviously the moment where she shoots Wesley and mm -hmm. uh, says something about having you know why do you think I never shot a gun before how much of her backstory have you guys sort of mapped out uh, do you have it in kind of broad terms right now we, we got a we got a pretty broad idea mm -hmm. of what happened in the past and and we really wanted to to nod to the classic Miller run mm -hmm. where you know and I'm, I'm not saying that we'll go as far as she falls into drugs and <laughs> and pornography right and, and sells Matt out for a, for a fix of dope <laughs> yeah but uh, there there's obviously something going on with Karen and and we we really want to explore that dark side in the comics she's quite a tragic figure mm -hmm. in that respect and uh, and Deborah Ann Wall just just hit all the right notes for, for giving that kind of uh, sympathy and the hint to a backstory, but still some some real backbone. As a Daredevil comic book fan, I, I felt I'd, I'd let myself down uh, by not guessing that Melvin Potter might be who could make his costume. Uh, for you, just looking at you know Daredevil and his history, and I know you talked about it, it didn't really make sense that he would just make his own mm -hmm. costume. Did that character, because he made Daredevil costumes just sometimes for other people. Sure. <laughs> that it just did that sync pretty easily? Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, it, it was a great idea that uh, Drew Goddard and, and Jeff Loeb had come up with by the time I got on. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we just started figuring out how, how do you layer in Potter? So I wanted to mention him. Yep. We mentioned him in episode four and I figure comic book fans will know who I'm talking about. Right, right. And then w once we actually see him, I really wanted to go full on with the idea that, you know, there is, there's something uh, mentally unstable about him, mm -hmm. um, you know, a bit childlike, mm -hmm. and wanted to bring in the reference to Betsy. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and really set it up. Uh, obviously, you see hints that he may become the gladiator mm -hmm. in the future. You see the, the pattern, and you see his schematics for Saul Blaze. Saul Blaze. Yeah. Um, and and the, the big Easter egg, the poster in the background, mm -hmm. which is a, uh, a, a gladiator redo of a very famous um, Daredevil cover. Uh, so yeah, uh, he really just fit in very neatly with the story. 
and and really gave a clear explanation of his of his outfit, mm -hmm. of Daredevil's outfit. Has a huge personal fan, by the way, of Gladiator as a kid. I think it was the saw blades on the arms that did it. I was I was excited about all of that. And so safe to say that yeah, you've you've got thoughts about uh, yeah. him. I was uh, interestingly uh, those saw blades that you schematics that you see in, mm -hmm. in episode thirteen weren't weren't in the script um, when I was prepping to direct and figuring out how to shoot the scene, I, uh, Lauren Weeks, our, our production designer, I said, hey, you know what would be really cool if we had schematics of like the saw blades and the spikes and just laid there so I can set the <laughs> chest down on and, and we threw it in and I'm so glad I did. As am I, as am I. <laughs> um, Leland Owsley uh, is you know, a pretty different interpretation of that character. Uh, there have been a lot of fans who've noted that you've mentioned a son a few times and could that be the owl? And I do have to ask the is he really dead question because some other characters, yeah. you know. It doesn't look good for him. Doesn't look good for him. It does I mean, not look good for him. Uh, uh, you know, he was thrown down an uh, elevator shaft yeah. and bleeding profusely from the skull. Yes. Uh, he is dead. Okay, he is dead. He is dead. Um, now, of course, if, if, if you know the, uh, the mythology of the mm -hmm. owl, um, Leland Owsley, the owl, had a father who was in high finance. Mm -hmm. So uh, will his son, Lee, be the owl? Hmm. We'll have to wait and see. Right. But, uh, but yeah, uh, I, I was always fascinated by the fact that the owl had a, had a father in high finance. And, yeah. Uh, and we really wanted to play around with that. Hmm. So maybe he has a son who also likes the color green a lot. It's quite possible. <laughs> it's possible. Uh, the <laughs> mention of the Greek girl in the college flashbacks, I feel like that was something that you were like, we have to do this, right? You know, once you knew you were going to do a flashback to college episode, did that, was that a pretty quick decision? Oh, yeah, yeah. And, uh, uh, you know, going back to the man without fear, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I wanted to nod to that, that college electra uh, kind of uh, feel mm -hmm. and uh, you know maybe one day if if the series gets picked up and we do more we'll eventually get to Electra um, but uh, you know I, I, speaking of Electra a lot of fans ask you know why didn't you do Electra Bullseye and it just it just didn't feel right coming out of the gate right it felt right. like uh, uh, Wilson Fisk was the right protagonist to start us off with the kind of the wire-esque world that we wanted to do um, but we did want to nod to the fact that uh, you know Elektra is out there somewhere. There's a sniper character, speaking of Bullseye, there's a sniper and there's a card and people were wondering if that had anything to do with Bullseye. Anything you can say there? I can say absolutely nothing, <laughs> except uh, that, that you know people have a fine, fine, astute eye. Yeah. Uh, whether or not that was Bullseye, <laughs> time will tell. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I, I loved Bullseye uh, growing up, especially you know the Miller run. Yeah. The classic Bullseye, Electra run. Mm -hmm. um, and like I said, hopefully sometime down the road, uh, you know, get there and earn that. But definitely something that I think if we would have started out with would have set slightly the wrong tone right. for what we were going for. Let's talk about killing Ben, which, you know, it's, it's a big moment. It's an important moment, emotional moment, and one that, you know, I think the more you know the comics, like myself, mm -hmm. it, the more shocking it is. Yes. Uh, because, you know, it's, it's Ben York, and he's a mainstay of not, not just Daredevil, but of the Marvel Universe. Yeah. Uh, so how did you come decide that poor Ben wouldn't make it through, and what did Marvel think about that idea? How did that all come I, about? I wish I could claim responsibility mm -hmm. for that, because I thought it was a very powerful decision. Mm -hmm. It was a Marvel idea. Really? Yes. Uh, from what I understand, when I came in and took over mm -hmm. the show from Drew, uh, you know, they pitched me the broad strokes of the season. Mm -hmm. And towards the end of the season, it was uh, it, it was always written in code on the board. I, and, and now I'm breaking the code. Uh oh. Code. I hope I don't get in trouble. <laughs> Jeff Loeb's gonna burst in. And, and uh, it, it, it said uh, Wilson Fisk uh, sends Ben Urich on vacation. Okay. <laughs> kind of a permanent vacation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and then I had the same reaction. I go, wow, you're killing Ben Yurick. Uh, you know, he's such a mainstay of the Marvel Universe. And they told me, yeah, uh, uh, you know, it was, a, it was a Marvel ask to kill Ben Yurick because they really wanted to set up the feel that despite everything you know about the comics, mm -hmm. that in this world it's very much anything goes. Mm -hmm. And um, and we hadn't cast the part yet, so we didn't know who would play him. And uh, after an extensive search, Von D. Curtis Hall just really killed it. Uh, and we, we love Vondi. I've always loved Vondi's yeah. work. And uh, a lot of times with actors, 
you know, you can only get them for a certain amount of time. Mm -hmm. So with Vondi, we could get them for one season, and it, it was just perfect. But I, I, and I always knew that would be very controversial, um, especially since, you know, he has such strong ties to Daredevil moving forward in, yeah. in the comics and also to uh, Spider-Man. Uh, but I applaud Marvel for, for taking that risk. Uh, I, I thought it was, it was a very important moment, specifically for Wilson Fisk. Mm -hmm. uh, and it felt right for the world. Mm -hmm. And if this was just a, a story we had made up with no connection to any uh, existing IP material, it would have absolutely been the right thing to do for the story. And, and I, I, I can't applaud Marvel enough for having the intestinal fortitude yes. to go through with something like that. Uh, speaking of Marvel, um, you know, you, you didn't go for, you know, a, a post credit scene, as it were, at the end of the season. Was there talk about that, given what the, yes. the Marvel movies were? Yes, very much so. Mm -hmm. um, originally, in Episode 7, the scene with Stick and his mysterious partner, mm -hmm. which most people know who it is because of the comics. Um, and the closing credits kind of had a name. Uh, well, that, that, that'll also keep you off the <laughs> yeah. closing credits. Um, and we wanted that to be uh, post-credit. Mm -hmm. uh, but we discovered, we, we ran afoul of with Netflix with their automatically starting the next yeah. episode. Um, they don't do post-credit right, right. stuff. So we're like, ah, okay, we'll fade to black and then we'll come up. Um, so we, we did have some discussions uh, early on about a, a post-credit scene for the finale. But because they really don't do that, we, we nixed it. Okay. I specifically was going to say, that scene kind of felt the end of the sick episode like mm -hmm. it could have been. Okay. Yeah. That makes yeah. a lot of sense. That scene, uh, the uh, the logo, the Steel Serpent logo on the heroine, uh, you know, uh, and this is where I know you might have to uh, be a code of silence with Marvel, but I'm still going to try. Anything you can say as far as how much of that stuff, you know, would be continuing in a Daredevil season two versus we know the Defenders is coming, you know, could it be a little of both as far as what you're layering in, layering in for the future? It certainly could be. Yeah. Uh, you know, being the first show out mm -hmm. of this 60 hour experiment that Marvel's doing, yeah. um, I, I wanted to, to lay some groundwork. Um, whether or not you know that that grows into something bigger, we'll, we'll have to see as mm -hmm. as the other shows progress. But obviously, with the Steel Serpent, a, a nod to Iron Fist, mm -hmm. and uh, and in that world, which is coming up down the line. Mm -hmm. So uh, you know, I, I really wanted to try to weave in as much as I could the the feel of the other shows. There was nothing I could really do at this point with Jessica Jones or Luke Cage. Right. But with, um, with some of the Iron Fist mythology, it, it felt natural to be able to drop that in. Mm -hmm. So hopefully we'll, we'll see more of this in the future. My, uh, what, what, what should we surmise about Gao? I mean, first of all, she was a pretty integral character, as it were. And then uh, her, her further than China mention, um, you know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, was it you know, fun for you to kind of layer in? Because it is a gritty, sort of grounded character, but we know he's part of the bigger Marvel Universe and there is a fantastical side mm -hmm. to this. So was that kind of your, your little opportunity to start to layer in that this stuff exists and one day this Daredevil may encounter it? That, that was definitely my point. Yeah. And there was a lot of just talk on the Marvel side about, you know, is it too early to start layering that in? Yeah. But I thought this is the perfect um, secondary character to mm -hmm. do that with. And, uh, you know, you, you, you start to get little hints of it. Like when she tells Wilson Fisk, he asks, how many languages do you speak? And she says, all of them. Right. Uh, there's obviously something a little bit odd going on there. And, and then she gives Daredevil the old iron palm. Yes. Uh, and sends him mm -hmm. flying. And then her, you know, the connection to the steel serpent mm -hmm. and uh, her saying her home is much farther away than China. Um, I actually got a tweet from Ed Brubaker after he finished... Uh, watching it and, and said, uh, is Madame Gao a crane mother? And I'm like, I can't say anything. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it might be monitored right now. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, on, as far as re regarding the, the bigger picture of Marvel, you're working with Jeff Loeb, you're working with Marvel. I am curious, uh, you know, at the time you were doing this, you know, and only maybe even partially, uh, Melissa Rosenberg, we knew, was doing Jessica Jones. Mm -hmm. um, now they've hired a, a showrunner for Luke Cage. Mm -hmm. I'm presuming we'll hear one for Iron Fist soon. What are your conversations like as far as those other shows? Were you talking to Melissa? You know, because it is going to be a piece of this larger right. thing. So how much, how much were you talking to all those guys about that? I had almost no time whatsoever. Mm. Um, Melissa had, had been hired, and, and there was a, uh, some version of the pilot floating around. 
Uh, but when by the time I got on to Daredevil, we were about 10 weeks away from shooting. And uh, we had two scripts written by Drew Goddard and, and a third one written by Marco Ramirez and uh, no cast, no crew. So I was full into Daredevil. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I, would, I would pass later on in the season when we were in production, I would pass Melissa in the hall and say, oh, we gotta have lunch, you know, we should really sit down and talk. And then I, both of us were just way too busy. Um, so real, I mean, thankfully, being the, the first part of, of you know, the, uh, this Marvel uh, experiment leading up to Defenders, um, I, I didn't have the burden of having to link up with any other shows. Right. I think as they move forward, it becomes infinitely more complicated because mm -hmm. you, you can't ignore the events that happen in, in one show with Hell's Kitchen, you know, when you move to the other. Right. So uh, is that, that's a long-winded way of saying it's their problem. It's their problem, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I can't wait to see what happens. <laughs> right. <laughs> so let me ask you about the future because we know that, we know this plan, right? We know that there are these other shows are coming. Mm -hmm. um, they're going to come, you know, Netflix said broadly a year apart, maybe not, uh, Jessica Jones by the end of this year leading to Defenders, but then the question becomes, well, what about a Daredevil season two? Because no, now that you've got a lot of fans, uh, no one wants to wait like three years or sure. so to see it. So have you had those conversations about, you know, could we do Daredevil season two simultaneously with these other shows happening? I can say absolutely nothing about that. <laughs> right. But obviously the response uh, has people thinking mm -hmm. uh, about the possibilities. Um, and, and with any big deal, there's always stuff stuff in your deal about uh, you know more seasons of right. the show. Obviously, with this model, it becomes exponentially more complicated. Mm -hmm. uh, if we go on to season two of Daredevil, while season two of Jessica Jones is being planned, if that goes well, while they're doing season one of Luke Cage and planning season one of Iron Fist, right. and it all's got to culminate in the Defenders. It's a uh, it's like a mathematical problem, mm -hmm. um, but I would love to see more, and uh, you know, I, I would love to see more of the fantastic cast. I know they would be game mm -hmm. for another round. So you'd be up for up for the challenge of uh, trying to link up with what you just said. Might be, you know, a few other shows. At the same Schedule time. permitting, yeah. I, I'm always up for a good challenge. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, in you know, how much have you thought about plot-wise where you want to go with season two? You know, you've mentioned possibilities like of Bullseye and whatnot, but have you thought about sort of what? an arc would be for season two? Is there things you're looking, Daredevil stories you're looking to for influence? We had some conversations as we were going through season one. Mm -hmm. uh, you always want to take a look at, you know, okay, what are we doing now that we could possibly build into future seasons? So there were definitely some conversations and, and some very interesting thoughts of where it could go. Again, I can say nothing, but uh, yeah, there were definitely some, some long conversations about that. Coming out of this weekend, a lot of people were saying, I did it myself on Twitter, how now that everyone has seen this and is so excited, how it wouldn't, it'd be so cool now to see, you know, Charlie Cox's Daredevil, Vincent D'Onofrio's Kingpin in one of the movies, you know, meeting these other characters. Uh, is that something you, you're hopeful we'll get to see too, you know? Uh, I would love to see be? that, uh, you know, uh, purely up to, to Kevin Feige mm -hmm. and, uh, and the feature side. Um, I, I would love to see it. I, I mean, who, who wouldn't love to see uh, Vincent D'Onofrio go up against Spider-Man? Right. Um, whether or not that'll happen, I think it's really too early to tell. Um, but right now, we're, we're just very happy that people have responded to this, uh, this new corner of the Marvel Universe. We were saying the other day, we were doing conversation here about the season overall, and we were saying that we're really hopeful to see D'Onofrio's Kingpin meet Spider-Man, and we're scared for Spider-Man. Yeah. Next to this depiction <laughs> of Kingpin. He's, uh, I mean, Vincent, I, I loved what he did. Mm -hmm. uh, it was such a joy to work with. And when he beats on Daredevil, he is such a big, imposing man, and, and you really get the feel that, okay, uh, you know, Matt Murdock has heightened senses, and he can flip around, but if this guy gets a hold of him, he's going to kill him, uh, which I loved. And, and Vincent really brought that feeling. Well, uh, you know, I was going to tell everyone where they can see Daredevil, but I realized they have to know at this point, you know, already. Netflix. But Netflix. Netflix. But, get Netflix. If you don't have Netflix, you need Netflix. But obviously, after this conversation, you want to go rewatch it, right? With all Absolutely. This insight. So, Stephen, thank you so much My for pleasure. coming in here. And, uh, you know, thanks for sticking around here to watch all this. And for plenty more on Daredevil, The Defenders, all things Marvel, keep it here at IGN.